Today's guest on Crystal Storytellers Podcast is journalist, author, and historian Ken Walsh. I come from a family that was always very interested in public affairs. My parents had, had seven newspapers a day in the house in New York City. That's when there were tons of newspapers in New York, and my parents liked different papers, so we had seven newspapers a day. A lot of people today, especially young people, can't fathom what that was like, because there's so many cities now that don't have a newspaper or don't have a competitive situation. Get ready to set sail with Ken Walsh as he shares fascinating personal stories with Crystal Symphony's cruise director as they sail in the South Pacific. Well, hello, everyone. This is Russ Thomas Grieve, cruise director aboard the Crystal Symphony. Seated next to me is Ken Walsh. To say Ken is a journalist, historian, and author is a, is a fall short in describing his distinguished career. Currently the White House and political analyst for U.S. News World Report, he has served as the magazine's White House correspondent for more than 30 years. Ken has won the most prestigious awards for White House journalism and is a former president of the White House Correspondents Association. In addition to being the author of eight books and a frequent commentator on television and radio, Ken is an adjunct professor lecturer at American University School of Communication in Washington, D.C. He has a B.A. in journalism from Rutgers University and an M.A. in communication from American University. Ken and his wife, Barclay, live in Maryland, but for the last few weeks, they've been sailing here in the South Pacific with us. Thanks for being here, Ken. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is the first time uh, that we've really sat down to be able to do this. You're one of the first that are going to be doing this podcast. So uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out of Great. your day. Ha to happy do to do it. Good. Uh, let's get right to the questions. It's hard to imagine how working in Washington must have changed in the past 30 plus years. Do you still love it today as much as you did when it started? Well, I do. I'm one of the fortunate people who's been able to do in his career what he set out to do. I'm from New York City originally, and my family moved to New Jersey, and I spent a decade in Colorado. But I always wanted to come to Washington and cover the White House and national politics, and I've been able to do that. And it, I had a series of great fortune uh, in moments in my career where I, the stars aligned and I moved up the ladder, and uh, so I'm doing exactly what I always wanted to do right now. And that really helps when you're covering the White House in, in difficult times if you've always wanted to do it and you enjoy doing it. And one of the reasons I enjoy it so much is that I, I'm always learning something, and, and it's still fun for me. This is a very difficult time to be covering the White House with President Trump because, as everyone knows, we have a very difficult relationship in the media with President Trump, at least in the mainstream media. But it's still a, a wonderful perch to observe politics and the presidency from covering the White House, even though we have more challenges now than ever. Right. Was it Washington journalism or maybe a president as a child that stood out to you that made you want to go to Washington, D.C.? Well, you know, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, part of my own history. I come from a family that was always very interested in public affairs. My parents had, had seven newspapers a day in the house in New York City. That's when they were tons of newspapers in New York, and my parents liked different papers, so we had seven newspapers a day. A lot of people today, especially young people, can't fathom what that was like, because there's so many cities now that don't have a newspaper or don't have a competitive situation with more than one paper. But I remember my mother uh, always realized I had a gift for language and for communication, and one thing that really set me on this path in journalism and being sort of a communicator is my mother would put on the refrigerator door a vocabulary word each day that I'd have to memorize the meaning and the pronunciation by dinner time. And if I didn't do it, I didn't get any dessert. So it was a tremendous motivator. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. It is. It, it really is. is. And uh, kudos to mom for doing she, that. She did that for years. Yeah. She was very, very interested in propelling her son. That was great. You must be absolutely fabulous at a, a Scrabble game. Yeah, <laughs> I am pretty good at Scrabble. That's right. Well, what has been the biggest challenge, do you think, in politics today? And is it is the change benefiting the country? Well, uh, th that last part, no, it's not. I mean, we have a very difficult relationship, and it's a very unhealthy relationship in our politics in the United States. It's not just the media's problem, the problem of the presidency. Our country is so divided and so polarized. We're living in, in separate compartments, really. We don't live near people in our neighborhoods that we disagree with, or, and we're, we're sort of self-segregating ourselves in some ways. I'm not talking about just racially, but ideologically and so on. And in, as far as information go gathering goes, people can find any view 
any ideology reinforced on the internet and in social media and increasingly Americans just don't want to get the other side and they don't really want to debate the other side and they see the other side as something wrong with them <laughs> instead of somebody who simply has a difference of views and this is partly why we have such a hostile political environment now people it goes back to the public people just uh, don't want to see the other side and uh, that middle split swing voters is getting us to be a smaller and smaller portion of our electorate and our politics and you see that in what's going on in congress and in the white house now each side the democrats and republicans are are waging political campaigns based on their base based on their more strongest adherence that means they don't want to compromise either and the result is we have what we see every day in washington now people fighting with each other Myself, I was never really interested in politics, but now I find that I'm much more, I don't know if involved is the word, but uh, wanting to hear more about it. And I, you think that's the norm with a lot of people now? I think a lot of people are interested. And I, and I, I must say that in this notion of polarization is still a very serious problem we have. And, and um, we can discuss that further if you'd like. But basically... Um, I wish more people were, were, were adopting the, the stance that you just described for yourself, that you're interested in more of it. What people are interested in is getting their views reinforced, not learning more about things. And that, to me, that's not really what the, the country should be doing. And I was brought up in the school of journalism where journalism is a public service and is, is public education. And we have two functions, entertainment and education and we, we're leaning far too much in the media toward entertainment these days in my mind but it's very difficult and this is a whole this is a lecture in itself really mm -hmm. uh, how people are um, expecting the media to entertain them more and more and that means a focus on for the media um, hits page views and so on and to get them you go more and more to the entertainment side, not to the education side. People just don't have the patience or the will, the willingness to learn about things, that, but they want to be entertained. And for the news media, that's a very difficult challenge because we have something called stovepiping now. The news organizations at the major news outlets have to pay for themselves. It's not like it used to be where a newspaper would be paid for by display ads, the big ads for Macy's and all the department stores and all. And that's served the money flowing into the news department. Now the news department has to pay for itself, and that means very much conscious on getting advertising for the news division and getting uh, readership or viewership, and that means more entertainment, more provocation, more coverage of conflict. And mm -hmm. so this is, I don't want to get too far in the weeds with this, but it's a tremendous problem in the media today. Just real quick on this subject, I want to ask one more question, and that is, I watch television when they bring these people to Congress, and they talk about behind closed doors, there's not as much theater, but when it's on television, they create theater. Yes. Is that along the lines of what you're talking about entertainment? That is true, but it's also, what's also true, and a lot of members of Congress will tell you this, and I covered Congress for years before I covered the White House, and still do to some extent, uh, but um, members of Congress now often will not associate with others of the other side of the other party as they used to. It used to be, you know, the classic story with President Reagan and Tip O'Neill, who was the Speaker of the House, different parties fighting all day, and then at night they'd have a drink together, and they'd tell jokes, and they, they, the, the veil would be lifted, and they'd be real people to each other and, and cordial. That doesn't happen nearly as much as it used to. Mm. In their off hours, lots of times if one member of one party associates with someone from the other party, especially if they're arguing about things, it's considered a betrayal that you're not supposed to hang around and get to know the other people. And that's a big problem in Congress and in Washington in general. The good old days are gone. The good old days are gone. And that affects us in the media, too, because a lot of members of Congress don't want to associate with the media either, so we don't get to know them as well as we used to. Right. And that applies to presidents, too. 
What do you think Shirley Chisholm would feel like today? Well, that's very interesting. She did run for president, mm -hmm. an African-American woman, uh, was very popular in, in, uh, the, on the left of the Democratic Party. I think uh, you have some people, when I first started covering politics, I'm very aware of Shirley Chisholm, and a lot of the Democratic women, and some Republican women, who were always sort of on the edge of some kind of a breakthrough, but didn't make it. Geraldine Ferraro, remember, she was a Democratic nominee for, with Walter Mondale, and they, that ticket lost. You have Barbara Jordan, who was a very, very respected congresswoman, African-American from Texas, a very wonderful debater, a wonderful speaker. Uh, but it was really too early for them. Mm. But now, I think if they were alive today, they'd be very pleased with how many women are running and how many have a serious chance. All right. We're going to talk about one of your great books here, Celebrity in Chief. All right. It's a history of the presidents and the culture of stardom. It discusses the phenomenon of American presidents need to be celebrities who build on their fame to forward their agendas and build public support. Well, your book was published in 2015, and that was uh, obviously before our current president. Right. Who some might argue is the biggest example of a celebrity in chief. How does President Trump fit into your theory, and do you think that his celebrity is uh, helping him push his agenda? Well, I think he fits in perfectly with the theory, and we're doing a, an updated edition of that book uh, with the Trump presidency uh, highlighted. He is an extension of exactly what I was saying in that book. Americans have come to expect their presidents to be not only commanders-in-chief, chief executive, and so on, but also celebrities-in-chief. And this is a pattern we've seen in all the modern presidents. Some are better at it than others, but you go back to Franklin Roosevelt, he was a celebrity president. He dominated the media of his time, particularly in radio, and he got into our homes in the fireside chats, mm -hmm. speaking directly to the American people. It's sort of a forerunner, in some ways, of Twitter with Donald Trump, <laughs> speaking directly to the country. Uh, which the media didn't like at the time, but it worked for Roosevelt and it's working for Trump. Uh, but we've had other celebrity presidents. Of course, President Kennedy was a celebrity president, very careful in, uh, in being groomed by his father for the presidency. And people tend to forget Joe Kennedy, the father, was not only a fabulously wealthy investor, he was a Hollywood producer. He made movies. He understood the concept mm -hmm. of celebrity, and he created a lot of that environment for his son. And his son always was fascinated by the idea of how does a, a president keep celebrity and keep his popularity up and keep uh, the public interested in him. And that's the key part of the celebrity. Uh, not just shallow celebrity, just fame, but using celebrity for specific purposes such as to promote your agenda. And uh, that's what President Kennedy did, President Reagan did, um, before that of course Roosevelt did, and uh, President Trump is doing that today. And one reason I say it takes this whole premise to another level is that he was a celebrity in our culture as a reality television star on The Apprentice. He hosted it. Now, in some cases, you could see what's happening in the White House in their communication strategy as the president being the creator, executive producer, and star of his <laughs> a reality show. There's drama. There's, he's always trying to put something out that's interesting or, or fascinating, dominating the news cycle. In some cases, you can see it as a reality show. I'm not saying that critically. That works for President Trump. But that's really what he's doing. He's capitalizing on this, our need for celebrity in our public figures to keep us entertained or interested. And he does that very well. He does. Yeah. Uh, speaking of celebrity, you spoke of Reagan just a little bit ago, and uh, he was a, a B movie actor, I believe, in the, his beginning uh, uh, infancy of, I guess, at Hollywood stardom. And um, was he somebody that was um, important to you? That, that you really looked up to as a president? Well, I've covered six presidents now, starting with Reagan in 1986 in his second term. And, you know, people ask me, you know, which, who are the most historic presidents I've covered, or the most interesting, who does I like the best? As far as history-making presidents, it's hard to, 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 for other presidents to compete with Reagan because not only did he change the direction of the country and make conservatism into a uh, sort, of, sort of conservatism with a smiling face, uh, a, a, a much more popular philosophy domestically. But he also worked in partnership with what he called the evil empire early in his life with yeah. the old Soviet Union and changed the course of our history by helping to end the Cold War, a huge accomplishment. And he, I don't think he got enough credit for that when he was president, but he was really a historic president in many ways. I got to know Reagan quite well. 
um, to the extent he let us know him, because there was part of himself he never let anybody know, including his children, except his wife Nancy. A tremendous story of a love affair. It was re it was it was real. But uh, we did get to know Reagan to some extent, and he was a very decent guy, a very cordial guy. The kind of things we see in the hostility in our politics, you rarely saw with Reagan. He did not let it get personal many times. And I'm, I try to be very careful in not being partisan in my talks or in my career, but I must say that Reagan, not as a political or partisan matter, but as a leader, uh, did capture a lot of the imagination of the country as Franklin Roosevelt had done by being optimistic. And that's what, if I'd say one lesson we can learn from our recent history is that Americans want their presence to be optimistic and to, th to believe things are going to get better and to convey that to the country. Reagan had a gift for doing that. You must have covered the uh, assassination attempt then. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, at that point I was covering Congress. That was in 81. Okay. And, and I was covering Congress, but I did, of course, cover that. Uh, and that was, uh, and I talk about the, that in my lectures aboard the ship, uh, uh, that was a tremendous surprise. People were so stunned mm -hmm. at that. Uh, but um, unfortunately now um, security is so intense around the president that what's happened is, partly because of the security, presidents lead very extraordinarily abnormal lives. They cannot really be in contact with people as they want to be because mm -hmm. of the security. Just that alone. And every president that I've covered complains about it. They wish they could be more accessible. But the Secret Service says, you know, we have to protect you. You can't just shake hands with people unless we're there, unless we supervise it. And how much of a candid conversation can you have with any president when you're surrounded by guys with guns <laughs> True. looking at your every move? Right. It's very difficult to do. What advice would you give up-and-coming students uh, on journalism? Yes, well, that's a very good question, Russ. I teach uh, at American University in Washington. I teach advanced courses in journalism, and, and um, I'm asked this a lot. And the, the, the two things I'd say is that to try to go back to basics and to uh, consider journalism as a form of public service. Um, you're not really there, in my mind, and I'm old school on this. You're not there just to make a lot of money or to get power. You're there to serve the public, to give them information so that the people can use to, to govern themselves. This is a const in our Constitution with the First Amendment. And the second thing is sort of a, a basic nitty-gritty level. Do the work. Even if you have to be an intern somewhere, even if you go in an unpaid position somewhere, if it's at all possible, the, it's very crucial for, the, for young journalists to do the work. Not, not wait around for the perfect job to come around, but just do it, as much of it as you can, that's indispensable in your career. That's great. Great advice. Yeah. Absolutely. So. All right, you've covered the White House in Washington for so long now. You must have uh, so many insiders and world leaders who've surprised you. Who, uh, who's been the most surprising? Well, I think a couple of things. Um, I didn't know Mikhail Gorbachev very well, but he surprised me and a lot of people in the the his willingness to reform the old Soviet Union. Um, you know, he, he we came from, I remember President Reagan saying, he, he hadn't met with any Soviet leader for, for his whole first term, and he kept saying, well, they, they kept dying on me. And it's true, he lost, they, they lost, I think, three leaders in his first term. Uh, but he wanted to build the United States up and be stronger before he met with the Soviet leader. But then the stars aligned, and Gorbachev was a genuine reformer, and his, he was a strong figure, and his health was good, and that paralleled Reagan. So, uh, but that was a real surprise at the depth to which he allowed the Soviet, old Soviet Union to unravel. They unraveled the whole empire. That was an amazing historical moment for people. And I think as time goes on, Gorbachev will be given. And he worked with Reagan on it. To some extent, by the way, he worked with the Pope on it, too. But um, it was really, without Gorbachev, none of that would have happened. And... Uh, as far as our in, domestically, um, there's a lot of people I've known, uh, you know, the, the presidents, their staffs, and so on. But I think that um, the, uh, as far as the historical and interesting people go, uh, it's hard to beat Bill Clinton as, as just a fascinating magnetic figure. Now, as we learned with Bill Clinton, unfortunately, there was a bit too much of self-importance and everything was about him and all the attention he always craved. But was a was a fascinating person, and by the end of his presidency, people felt he might have been a scoundrel 
and a rascal in his public private life, but publicly people liked his policies and people made the distinction between the private and the public president. And um, frankly, I think that's part of what President Trump is trying to do today. You may not like what I say or how I say it or, or my, my uh, character or whatever, but just judge me on the policies. And that, that's, you're going to see that in the 2020 campaign just about every day. We got a long two years ahead of us. <laughs> we I do. Would say. We do. So, what's the biggest story in the news today that's not getting the coverage you think deserves? Well, I think it's basically that lack of civility. I mean, you see that covered to some extent, but I think, and it's not just in Washington. I think it, it's across the country, and I think people have to sort of examine their own consciousness, their own consciences, going back to my old, old parochial school days, <laughs> uh, and realize that uh, is it really doing us much good as a country? And as a culture, where we increasingly not only distrust but but hate our adversaries, and uh, we don't want to talk to them, and I think that's something that, not just a social science or sociology question. This is an everyday question in people's lives. Um, you know, what kind of country do we want to be? Do we want to be in these warring camps all the time? Uh, there was a time when people felt that that was not a good thing, but now we've slipped into this phase where people are just so distrustful and cynical about each other that uh, I think it's it's unhealthy. And I, I, I hope we can change that. I hope so as well. Yeah. You gave three lectures while you were here uh, on the Crystal Symphony, and um, one of them was about Air Force One, which I find fascinating. Uh, obviously, you've ridden on Air Force One. Yes. Isn't there another press plane that also precedes the president's uh, arrival? And yes. So who decides... Who rides on the press plane and who rides in Air Force One? How is that all decided? Right. Well, by the way, I've given my talk on Air Force One many times, including on Crystal many times, and it, it never happens that someone doesn't come up to me. In other words, people always come up to me afterwards and say, I've ridden on the plane. I worked on it. I've had pilots and co-pilots and navigators, and people who've seen the plane. It has a tremendous mystique, and people really resonate with that aircraft because it's come to symbolize the United States, the presidency itself, and the uh, technological prowess of the country. But basically, to answer your question, it's much more complicated than people might realize for president to travel. Um, not only does Air Force One go to different places, but you have giant cargo planes taking everything you see mm -hmm. that a president has everywhere. Helicopters, motorcades, uh, supplies, uh, extra staff, Secret Service, military, and they have to be gotten there. Then there's a backup. There's a, uh, there's a primary Air Force One, the 747. It's really not the name of a plane. It's when the president is aboard that it's called Air Force One. But in shorthand, there are two 747s, and both of them always travel. As far as the media go, we pay for our own press charter. We pay an airline company to take us wherever the president goes, and we pay for all that. And then the, the reporters who travel on Air Force One, and I've done that about 300 times now, um, that cost, we, they charge us 100% of first, a first class airfare plus 50% to be on Air Force One. That number is 11 journalists and photographers is then added together and put in the whole cost of the trip. So you're not paying extra to be on Air Force One, which rotates around the press corps. We take turns. So, but it's becoming so expensive to travel, um, just fuel costs and the charters. Fewer reporters travel. The news organizations don't want to pay for it. That means others have to pay more, and that causes a vicious cycle, fewer travel. So it's tr a tremendous expense to travel with more than I've ever seen before. And a lot of news organizations don't want to do it anymore. They don't want it because you're not getting the, the time with the president that you used to get. You're not getting the time with the senior staff. And so it's hard to argue when you're spending on three trips, you could hire somebody for that amount of money. Right. It's hard for somebody like me to say, no, I want to go on the trip. You can't hire a, you know, a junior reporter for, for three trips, and that's what it would amount to. When was the last time you were on? I have not been on for uh, more than more than a year. I haven't been on with President Trump okay. uh, because because of these financial situations and because it's very difficult to get any special access to him. I mean, he's accessible, but it's basically the kind of thing he would say on a Twitter or tweet or something, and you don't really get to know him. Right. And that's used to be one big reason to travel on Air Force One to get to know the president. We don't get that anymore, and so that's another reason not to go. Most available, most elusive. 
Yeah, exactly. Oh, which one? No, of all oh. the presidents you've covered, most well, available, most elusive. the most available was uh, was Bill Clinton, because Bill Clinton loved the attention, and so he would get mad at us in the press, not only because of stories we did, but we, you know, shouting questions at all presidents hate that when you shout questions. President Trump is in the middle of a fuss about this now because he he banned reporters from a news conference with the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, because they were shouting questions at him. But presidents always hate that. But what Clinton would do is he'd get mad at us in the press corps. It was always a roller coaster ride. But then he'd get past it. And then he'd talk to us again. And he, I would talk to him many, many times on Air Force One. One time, I remember, coming back from Australia, and you know how long that flight is. Um, I was the only reporter awake, and it was like 3 a.m., and, you know, trip time, and he showed up in the press cabin. All he wanted to do was talk to people. He, he Everybody was exhausted on his staff in his sleep. He showed up by himself, and I was there uh, in the press cabin, all awake, the only one of the press awake. And when that happens, you have, you have to decide, um, do you wake up all your colleagues, or do you just talk to the president, and then you're not in a news conference with the lights on and all. I would owe everything I got to the rest of the press corps. That's the rules of traveling on Air Force One. So that's what I did. I just talked to him myself and briefed my <laughs> colleagues later. And they said, he was here? I said, yeah, he was here for a half hour. I talked to him for a half hour by myself. But that's what you want. So uh, Clinton was really the most successful, not in a sustained way, in a sporadic way, but it, it was hard to match his level of accessibility. You snooze, you lose, right? That's right. <laughs> um, what's the biggest secret you've ever had to keep? But you probably can't tell us because then it's not well, a secret so, anymore. Some of them I can't tell, but I can yeah. just to just to give you the, how this this profession I'm in works. Yeah. Um, remember the Persian Gulf War, um, launched by President Bush the father to push Iraq out of Kuwait. <clears throat> um, as that. Uh, planning continued. It was clear that we were going to go in militarily and do this as the United States. Um, the plan, we we um, uh, got to know what the plan was at U.S. News, partly because one of our war correspondents, and that's another interesting dynamic in the media, we don't have a lot of war correspondents anymore. We used to, in journalism, have war correspondents. So that's what they did. But our war correspondent was, was about to cover the Persian Gulf War from the ground. I was covering from the White House in Washington. He had served in Vietnam with Norman Schwarzkopf, who was a commander of the Allied forces in Iraq in, in that theater. And Hal Moore was, and they made the movie We Were Soldiers Once and Young mm -hmm. with Mel Gibson. Right. And he, this guy's name was Joe Galloway. Anyway, because of his trust that he had with the senior military leaders, by this time, the people he knew as young officers had become, are running the show. They let him know the secret plan, and I got to know it myself. That became known later as the left hook, where our, our forces did, a, did a, a, a flanking movement around the Iraqi troops and completely surprised them. But uh, you know, just showed that sometimes there is a level of trust there between officials or the military and the media that's in it to everyone's advantage. And that, that kept, that, that secret kept. But we knew that at the time. It's hard to see how that happened very, happening very often because there has to be an extraordinary level of trust there right. for that kind of thing to happen. But it, it, it held, and that, that, was, that was like a, a, a sacred thing to our war correspondent. He would never have revealed that, uh, except in, internally in a very, very tiny group at U.S. News because we had to get ready to cover the war. And, of course, this, the plan worked beautifully. Right. And but that was that was one example of the secret that we, we kept the inside stories. Can <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, we're down to the last couple of questions. So what's next for you? Well, I still love doing this. I still love covering the White House. I'm at the point now in my career when I'm I'm able to give a lot of speeches. I'm able to travel. Obviously, here on Crystal, I'm able to write books. And I have another book I'm writing right now. It'll come out next year about presidents in crisis. I'm going to take a crisis for each of the modern presence and look at it very exhaustively to see what works and what doesn't work in a crisis for a president. So I have a lot of perches now I'm on, in addition to covering the White House, and that's, so I'm going to continue doing that. As long as I still like it and learn, I'm going to still do it. Excellent. Now, last question. If you were to write a news article about the Crystal <sighs> Symphony, what would that headline read? It would be that uh, this is a case where um, 
it's really uh, delightful to see people who are as engaged and interested in learning about things as you see among the guests on Crystal. Uh, you know, when you when you uh, when you're a speaker, many times it's so helpful to have people interested in learning what you're talking about and taking an interest in sort of a wider world uh, beyond their own immediate world, and you get that on Crystal. So I would say it's really the engagement and the uh, willingness of the guests to learn that's very impressive to me. That's a long headline, but I okay. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> a long headline. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I get it. I understand. So you can find all of uh, Ken's. Books and information on KennethWalsh.com. Exactly. That's my website. Okay. That's right. And, and yeah. uh, you can read all, how many books in total? Eight? Eight, eight books, yeah. Eight books in total. And yes. uh, anything else you want our guests to know? Just, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm always happy to talk with the folks on the ship, of course, and uh, I'm going to be doing a number of cruises this year. And um, something that uh, I enjoy doing, and I'm really so happy that people respond so positively. So I just wanted to pass that on, too. I've had nothing but great feedback about you, Ken, and we look forward to welcoming you back to the symphony. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for everything. that You're doing a great job, too. So thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. And we will do this again maybe sometime again in the future. That would be great. All right, thanks for listening, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Crystal Storytellers. If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. For more information about upcoming Crystal sailings, please visit www.crystalcruises.com. See you next week when we are joined by former member of the British Diplomatic Service, Sir Michael Burton.